Uh, so today we're uh, very pleased to have Matthew Landowski from Northwestern who's been telling us about computational uh, systems and their causality constraints beyond. Awesome. Uh, so thanks everyone for uh, inviting me today and, and coming to the talk. Um, yeah, I haven't given a, a Blackboard talk in a few years, so, <laughs> you know, uh, hopefully this will be all right. Uh, but anyway, um, so today I'm going to talk about a recent project uh, with these people where we uh, were thinking about causality uh, conditions and thinking about EFTs and, and causality constraints and, and things like that. Um, this will be definitely a, a talk of going over our results and everything, but I also want to show some of the kind of modern amplitudes methods that we use to do the calculations or at least hint at them. So there'll be some you know, formulas and going through stuff. So feel free to ask uh, you know, questions at any time and I'll just kind of uh, figure it out in terms of timing. Okay, so the basic thing that we're gonna look at is two to two scattered. Um, and, and we're gonna compute scattering amplitudes. And um, so to do that, I just wanna get some of our conventions down and get the kinematics. Um, so we're all kind of talking um, in language. So I'm doing all ingoing uh, momenta. So the scattering amplitude is a uh, Lorentz invariant, and it's a function of the Lorentz variant, uh, the Mandelstam variables, which are given in terms of these momenta. These are going to be massless external states. So these momenta are all null. So S, T, and U are the typical angle stands from Pascan or something everywhere. Okay. Um, a lot of times, so this Q is the exchange momentum. This will be important in some of the calculations we're doing. So I'm just going to write at least one parameterization, center of mass parameterization of these momenta, just so you can have a, a picture of the kinematics here. If I remember how to do these boards, we'll be able to reference uh, these yeah, for real. So I just pick the uh, center of mass parameterization. Um, of these momenta. And the main thing I want to um, want to show here, or, or the main thing that will be in, of interest to us is that uh, K1 plus K3, which is uh, how you get um, T up there is just equal to Minus uh, Q. So I, I'm going to use beta is plus minus minus minus. So I assume that this crowd is kind of divided on what to do here. But the, the signs, the sign don't seem too much, right? Uh, so we shouldn't conserve momentum. So I have two negatives. These cancels. No, no, I mean K1 plus K3. Ah, K1 plus K3. Just gives me uh, Q, yeah, the P's cancel, omegas, yes, it's zero. Is that what? Plus Q1 Ten. plus Q. Oh, plus. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Plus. Yeah. Is that K? The, the square, K, that means that T is minus Q squared. That's what I want. That's what I want. Okay, so um, one thing that, that will come up is that if, if you want this to be in the center of mass frame, all these omegas are, are the same and these are all null vectors, you need that P dot Q uh, is equal to zero. You could just work it out as momentum conservation. 
So Q is this exchange momentum, and it's essentially uh, a two-dimensional vector. Um, okay. So sometimes we just call it Q or Q perp because it's perpendicular to the momentum of the external particles. So, okay, let's get to what we're actually going to do. So the amplitudes, the kinds of amplitudes we're going to look at are amplitudes where we exchange uh, gravitons. Um, I'll use this double line for gravitons. So imagine all the particles have minimal coupling. So these vertices are the at Planck's. We're going to be interested in forward scattering, which means T is much, much or S is much, much bigger than T. This is just the regime where basically the particles, you know, very little deflection angle. They just move uh, past each other. So it's a high center of mass energy. S is also, by the way, like the center of mass energy. Um, yeah. Maybe with a four, I forget. So one thing that uh, is gonna be very, very useful for us is that in this regime, in the forward scattering, you can actually resum a lot of these diagrams and, and get a sort of non-perturbative result in what, what's called the iconal regime. And that will be important for us. So that's this S much bigger than T. So the next uh, kind of diagram that's, that's relevant in that regime is a two exchange of gravitons like this. So you resum the ladder of that? Exactly, it's gonna be the ladder resum. Um, so if, I, if here I write the amplitude, I'll tell you, right, born just because it's a one, um, one exchange. Take my word for it that the amplitude here is S squared over T. Now, if we want to look at what this two loop one is, well, in this forward limit, basically it means that you know momenta is essentially you know conserved along the rungs and very little momenta is exchanged because T was that you know exchange momentum. So in that limit, basically you could put these um, propagators on shell and you could write um, this one loop amplitude. T is minus Q squared. And it's just a convolution. of two of these born amplitudes. Um, so it's, it's just a convolution, which means back in, in real space, it's a product of, of amplitudes, which is what you expect when you, you know, put, put two of the internal lines on shell. Now, at two loop, it does the same thing. I'll say writing it, but just a convolution of A, 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 of, of three of those borns. And, you know, you can just go through and do um, that, that do all the uh, combinatorics, right, and stuff. You essentially end up with a resummed amplitude in the iconal limit. Yeah. yeah. So graviton graviton interactions are su further suppressed, or we're just not. Yeah. So each one of these is going to be leading order in, in one of our m Planck squares. So basically, you can't have any. So the top one is one of M Planck squared. This one's one of M Planck to the fourth. And any extra graviton insertions will give you extra M Planck's. So at every loop, right? And, and then there is uh, the non planar uh, Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. So these convolutions take into account the fact, 
the fact that like you can do this basically. Um, and so they have a sum over because of the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it gives you all the positions of where the leg ends up. Yeah. So you could have a higher diagram to so the ladder that is uh, a higher order and then Planck and say a lower one where you'd have some graviton interaction, right? Yeah, so like so I'm just you know you could choosing sort of what I want to keep. You right? could have this, right? Yeah, this has two extra one over m planks in it. Yeah. And so in leading order an S much greater than T, this will be su super suppressed compared to the one that's uh so loop loop by loop. Yeah. Uh, so these are just further. Yeah, so like this is what one over M Planck to the fourth. This one's one over M Planck to the fourth. Yeah. But in the icono limit, basically this has extra powers of T over S, and it will just never thank you. You never you can never, you know, uh, beat the even the lower the lower orders. Is that true also of like three photons? So these are these are gravity. Yeah. You mean like just this? No, the one with like a thing splits into two. Oh yeah, I will get actually to, to doing loops. So maybe to get to where where I'm going is that what we're going to do is compute two photon external states, uh, a graviton emission like this with some spectator field, and we're, we're going to compute one loop uh, here due to like um, charge states that are coupled to the photon. Now, loops that are kind of like, you know, did, so I'll write down the orders and the way, you know, the parametrics, but, you know, different kinds of loops, um, you know, for example, like if having, yeah, gravitons like this, like those are all subleading. Okay. So I will get here. Um, but yeah, that's where we're going to, to compute one loop corrections, but at the vertex. So um, let me just write this. This B is just, uh, so like I said, this is convolutions, which means it probably has a nice, um, it's a good idea to do a Fourier transform. This B is impact parameter, so we we normally call this impact parameter space, but it's just uh, Fourier transforming from the Q that we're integrating over. These factors not super important, but I just want to write. So it exponentiates this basic uh, diagram from up there. And it looks like this. And so at any order, you can expand the exponential and you can figure out which uh, one of these things um, you're computing. Now, it turns out that, that this is, yeah, it's called iconal resummation. Um, this quantity here is called, or er, inside, uh, is called the, the phase, the scattering phase, delta. Phase shift. Um, this is going to be a, a, a key quantity um, that we're going to use. This is delta S and B. Um, it's just this integral, it's the thing that gets exponentiated to compute this amplitude. Um, this phase comes about many other kinds of ways. Like if you expand the four point amplitude in, um, in um, Partial waves, this is just basically the large L part of the partial waves. You'll find that it has exactly this form as well with a phase shift. How, how does the convolution comes about uh, when, when you do this? Like, why is this a convolution? Yeah, how, because that looks like an integral that you do and depends on S and B. And then how does uh, that reproduce uh, the convolution and momenta that you want to get uh, for several? Oh, well, basically, yeah, like, you know, when you expand this out, you get a bunch of powers of A born, and then you have the one overall momentum conservation. So it will it will be like K1, K2, and then uh, Q 
Oh, oh, oh you're you assuming because of the low T approximation, then you can separate the integrals or what? Can uh, you separate what? Well, in principle, uh, K, K1 affects K2, etc. And they are all convoluted, right? But in that expression, they are not, right? Well, if you expand it out, they'll, they'll be all convoluted. Why? How? That, well, that is an absolute integral. So there is a... Yeah, so if I expand this, say, to, to third order in A, and then it'll be like this integral cubed uh, acted on by this integral, and I get one delta function oh, from oh, the oh, overall. Oh, oh, oh. Very good, very good. I, I take it back. So these are, you know, internal. I understood. No, no, fine, fine. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Good, good. Um, yeah, so this phase shift is, is very interesting. It's, um, you know, um, there's, you know, very popular paper by Maldesena where they look at uh, three point functions and use this phase shift. But I will, for time's sake, tell you why, why it's interesting. Uh, the interesting thing is that we can compute a time delay. Basically, you imagine it's the time difference between if you do a scattering or if you don't do a scattering. And this is uh, given by a derivative of the phase shift uh, with respect to the energy, which like I said, is just E squared. And this is, uh, also a kind of classic result, but um, the phase shift determines the, the time delay. So, so like when people, uh, yeah. Yeah. when people do like uh, shock wave scattering, scattering, yeah, this is like the derivative shift. That's basically the... exactly. Yeah. So, so the, the, a classic example, which I'm about to do, oh, okay, uh, is the shock wave. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So let's compute the lowest order thing here, which is just uh, this um, phase shift for the amp Born amplitude that I wrote up there. And I'm going to do everything in four dimensions, but um, where actually there's kind of interesting stuff with, in the IR with gravity, but it will be fine for us. So um, I'm going to write. Um, Now, since all the signs are going to be very important in, in this paper, notice there is a minus sign up there, but it, it, um, since I put it in terms of Q squared, I'm doing T is mi minus Q squared. So this sign is right. So um, the way you do these kind of integrals is do complex um integration so we're, we're integrating over q q1 and q2 so in the q1 complex q1 plane um i've got uh basically a pole at q1 equals i q2 um somewhere like that and so i'm going to do this integral by doing a contour in the upper plane so just to kind of write some things for people, I'll see what these kind of integrals. And I, I pick, uh, because of rotation variance, I pick uh, one of the directions of, of where B is pointing. Mm -hmm. So I have the And this uh, integral picks up the Q1 equals IQ2. And then you get to do the Q1 integral. And then you're left with a, a higher divergent um, Q2 integral. I'll just write so you can see it. You have to put an higher cutoff here. Okay, and this, um, we're going to be, uh, so yeah, let me just, this is proportional to, um, again, I mean, this is just a gamma, incomplete gamma function. 
in um, E over BIR. And so I imagine I have some IR cutoff BIR, which is very large scale, which is something much larger than we'll be probing in this experiments. And B, which is my actual impact parameter of the scattering will be much smaller than that. And then, so in B over BIR, very small, this does give me something with a definite sign. And which is this kind of famous log. So yeah, there was a question. Yeah, so this time delay, you have a you have a fixed just you have a fixed flat background, and then you're asking if there were gravitons propagating, how long would it take for the photons to, to travel? And then if there were no gravitons, how long it take? Yeah, in, in this example, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this is um, this is the result from the shockwave. Um, so yeah, this kind of process is exactly what you get at ultra high energies where like the gravitational field of one particles is like a shockwave for the other particle. Um, okay, so this is, this is like a classic result. And, and this leads to, uh, from our formula, delta T is bigger than zero with, when B is less than BIR. So it has a definite sign. Um, Okay, but this is the gravity, this is basically the pure gravitational contribution. Okay, so now what we want to do is um, we want to consider uh, scattering photons with some standard model particles in a loop, so some gauge corrections, and then interacting through gravity, doing the same scattering. So this is going to be the correction from the standard model. To the, the phase shift. Okay, and so you know we're not going to higher orders in one over m Planck. We still have just one over m Planck squared for here, but you know we're going to the next order in the gauge coupling uh, g. Um, okay, so okay, and then basically what we're interested in doing is saying. We want to look at this loop. We want to uh, see how it changes the phase shift and the time delay and see if this causality condition uh, demanding that T is bigger than delta T is bigger than zero is actually a good condition. And we actually consider two possible conditions that maybe you, you, you would think of. One of them seems to make sense when you include the loops and, and the other one doesn't. So, so that's basically um, where we're going to try to get to. Any questions? Four, yeah. So the philosophy is to get a condition on some low energy. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Some gravity background. Exactly. So what, one way to look at what we're doing is to essentially, we would like to have some kind of conditions on EFTs, right? And we would like, the so positivity of amplitudes is one of them um, that I've done before. Also this time delay, right? And so you, you, you do some calculation with an EFT, and then if it violates the, the time delay or it has a time advance, then you, you should conclude that the EFT has to break down basically. So, so we, we want to investigate that in an in a example where we actually know what's happening in the UV of this loop. So we can look from the EFT side and also from the side of having the one loop calculation. Yeah, so, so I mean, just a linear order in, in, in linear gravity, how, how could causality break down? I don't understand. Um, sorry, linear gravity? You, you, you mean just gravity? Or what do you mean linear? I mean, where you're treating gravitons at, uh, you know, at one loop order or, or less. But, but sorry, yeah, they, they don't, they, they do satisfy this condition. Okay. Yeah, so anything scattering is made slower by, by gravity. And that's good. Um, but now we want to know what happens um, if we include other particles. Okay, so, um, okay, what's the best? So, yeah, let's say that. Um, so you're saying the other particles can change the causal structure of the theory? Yeah, exactly. So now, now we're gonna, we're gonna scatter photons. And so we have the helicities of the photons that we get to play with. And we get to see if 
any of the scattering of this photon, like when it's allowed to make the time uh, delay uh, change sign. So like what Malvasena did was scatter gravitons. He, he did was looking at the graviton three point function against some spectator and look at when this would produce a time uh, advance and then use that to constrain the couplings that you're going to have in gravity. Um, but he, here we're, we're looking at the photon sector. You have to also include a three level photon uh, scattering too. And then you just looked at it as a correction. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely including this one. In fact, it, it basically just gives you the same thing because um, this is just, do, this is the universal result of, uh, from the equivalence principle, basically. So once you take away uh, the polarizations, it just gives you the same, same thing. So even if the loop diagram give you absolute subleading contribution to that time delay, do you still get a bound? Yeah, 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 definitely. So maybe it will help to see how these things are scaling. So, um, so the tree, the, the tree level delta that I computed there was S over M pong squared times this log of B. Okay, so delta, um, let's say pure gravity. So that's a real uh, graviton loop in the, in the vertex. This is a full extra power of m pong squared. These are super small. Well, I'll, I'll show you the lean one at the end. Uh, there's a, 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 a correction that you can have basically from, um, you know, the, the post-Newtonian or, you know, classical corrections which is just a diagram like, and it's the H diagram that I showed, like when the graviton's like this. Yeah, sorry, that's weird. Uh, these depend on the Schwarz shield radius. So we're gonna also be in the limit where the, where the uh, impact parameter is much bigger than the Schwarz shield radius. So we don't see these classical effects. Sorry, Matt, what diagram generates that middle phase shift? The second one you've written? The thing you call pure gravity? Yeah, so that would be like, um, like actually, if this is a graviton, if, if this is uh, all the graviton. Uh, loop of gravitons. Loop of, real loop of gravitons at the vertex. Okay, so that scales the same way as like uh, R cubed coupling or something. Is that right? Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, I get one over m pop to the four if I do that. And exactly, I think, but like, now we're, we're gonna never uh, go down to the punk length of the impact yeah, yeah, parameter. Yeah. So um, this would be the, the more, uh, the more, um, so this classical one would be this gravity one. But what we're gonna find here from the standard model, now, like I said, this depends on, um, this depends on the, the gauge coupling. So. Is it M-Punk squared? This M is the mass in the loop of, of the whatever particle. And this is for um, small Bs. Is for large bees. So the, um, the the takeaway is is just that these corrections that we'll find in the standard model um, are are much bigger than the pure gravity ones. Uh, you know, as long as we're at um, high energy scattering, but with a um, B that's bigger than the Schwarzschild radius and bigger than the Planck radius. Um, and they're proportional to these gauge couplings. And I will discuss a little bit the details of how to get these contributions and, and then what they mean uh, in a little bit more detail. But yeah, any questions of the scaling still? Basically, I mean, one of the key takeaways is gonna be that that top one is 
log b and the next one's log b squared. Uh, and then those two can compete, b gets small enough, um, but it, it, none of the other ones will, will compete if there's a window. So we kind of um, do a, a um, turbo uh, through how we do this calculation. So this uh, three-point vertex with on-shell photons, some kind of interaction, and then an off-shell exchanged um, graviton, you can do by just basically taking the matrix elements of the conserved current that's related to you know, this linear state that you have, h mu nu. So the coupling and the action h mu nu and t mu nu with some uh, external uh, photon states k and k prime, which are going to be on on shell. So, I'm confused about your step. So the large log, right, that you mentioned can possibly fit the tree level contribution. Yeah. Is that the usual um, large log problem that requires us to do the resummation, like RG run? Yeah, actually. Then we normalize the case. No, yeah. So we, we also talk about that. So those are contributions from massive uh, vectors, basically. And they're, they're even another log above. They're like log cubed in that formula. And those you resum, and they have a slightly different dependence. Um, they, they, they're even extra safe. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that again, because it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, so basically, you can compute this matrix element to whatever order you want with whatever kind of particles in the loop. Um, this has some um, tensor structure, like if I do, these have helicities H and H prime. Um, well, it's, I think, I, okay, it's probably worth to write something here. So there's a tree level contribution, which is basically the helicity preserving part of uh, this loop. At tree level, um, this interaction only preserves the helicity of the photon. But at the loop level, it can it can uh, you can have helicity violating terms. So the tree level term um, preserves helicity. So there's some tensor structure here, which I'm not going to write, and then some form factor. This we call or it's called F1, and then there's other tensor structures um, that um, I make this there. Least painful. Oh, just write it. You know, you have some structure of dotting the uh, external um, polarizations with the momentum. This part not super important, but it's multiplied by another form factor f two, and there's some other tensor structure, which is almost the same as this, but it's some different momenta times F3. And you can basically just deduce this form from gauge invariance, uh, conservation of the stress tensor, but Lorentz invariance. You pick out these three different structures. Weinberg does it for the, for the vector um, current for stuff. And so you can see how to organize these things, but the main, uh, Things that we're going to compute are these Fs, which are going to contain all the information about this loop. And so at tree level, uh, F1 is equal to one, and F2 and three are zero. So that's why we did tree level there. And then all the loop corrections will, will change these. So we want to compute the changes in these Fs. Um, they will enter the time delay formula. Um, yeah. So the, the delta t being greater than zero, yeah. would I change that if I had, say, negative energy or something? Like if I violated some energy, energy conditions, conditions. And gravity, that, right? That, that's basically true. Is it the same as, yeah, I don't know, negative, it's kind of like going backwards in time, I guess. Yeah, maybe, yeah, it's possible. I don't know exactly how, but. Yeah, it makes 
just probably something there. Yeah, I, I'm not sure though. Um, okay, so the way that we calculate these um, these Fs is we basically use. Um, oh, actually, so it turns out that this whole calculation we'll be able to do in terms of on shell uh, quantities. So at one loop, you can compute this loop on shell and, and this whole scattering amplitude, which is kind of nice because you don't, it's a nice way to do the calculation um, uh, with these on shell methods. And um, it, it means that only on shell data enters the, the calculation. So what is on shell data is basically like poles or discontinuities of, of the functions. So um, what we'll actually compute are the discontinuities of these functions across T bigger than four M squared. So, so this is some particle, I should say, it's either gonna be charge scalar particle, uh, a vector uh, W or a fermion, and it'll have a mass, whatever mass it is. So we, so we do it once for each, each particle but I kind of just refer to them all together here. Um, so across this cut um, is what we're gonna compute this function. So actually we just wanna look at the discontinuity of both sides of this equation. Um, and so well, for the four, yeah. So, so you're working, I guess one thing that I'm confused about here, you're working with the standard model coupled to like linear gravity interactions. So no loops of gravitons right. and a flat background. So it's a combination of- Well, yeah, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Like this particle that we're, this is like a spectator, some spectator field that you can think perturbs the, it actually perturbs the space time. So there is, okay. yeah. So we're computing the scattering in a perturbed, a, a weakly perturbed uh, background. I see. You could spectator particles. So I was going to say those ingredients are all causal ingredients. So you're never going to get a violation of causality That's with the ingredients I described. Wrong. Or you can have higher curvature coupling than your Lagrangian. You really get violations. They're not guaranteed to be. Exactly. At EFT levels when you start at, and that's kind of the motivation. It's like if you start adding in if new higher linear, linear gravity, is a non-causal. If you have R two couplings with the wrong sign. Yeah. Is that what you're doing here? I guess. Yeah. So we're basically getting to to the to the point where, well, the, I mean, this is just motivated by saying that if I have an EFT, like I should not be able. So and I start adding in random operators, you know, that I would normally like to add in the EFT, then this is a condition that sort of tells me which operators I'm allowed to add, because they won't all really be causal. But you you want to preserve this. Um, this condition. So it's a constraint on low energy EFTs. Well, where does the RQ enter? Sorry, we're not doing RQ at all. That's what Malvasena did. Uh, it looks like a, a, all your particles in the loops are all UE completed, right? You, you're not well, these operators. are st standard model particles. These, these are like. Um, in what sense you're adding operators rather than just all the couplings already you know? So for, so for example, I can imagine having this theory with these particles in it, or one of them, and I can integrate out the massive particle, right? That will generate some EFT between- and that, that certainly is not going to violate anything. No, it, it can't, because it'll, it'll induce like RF squared couplings, exactly. which in principle could be a problem, but they're a problem exactly- but These are all known couplings, right? These are known, known particles. No, that's true, but you would with, infer- With renormalizable couplings, right? So, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So, so in what sense you are violating anything? This, is, this does not, so the, the perspective is that if I wrote, like you're saying, some alpha one R F squared, alpha two. So say I integrate out these particles. You're right, then if I start with the UV complete theory and I integrate out the particles, I will only obtain the, um, uh, the kind of theories that, that I'm allowed to obtain. Uh, but if you, um, but what we wanna do is, we basically wanna see that from the EFT side, that if I say started with this action, um, I would think that it's totally reasonable. I'm not necessarily 
know where the UV physics came from or, or, or whatnot. I would take this, I would compute the time delay or some, some, some constraint, which I believe should be satisfied by the theory. Then that will place constraints on what these couplings can be. So what we wanted to do is basically have a concrete, well, one of the aims is to have a concrete example where we actually know what the UV part of the loop was. So we see how you go from an EFT behavior that looks like it's starting to violate this condition, but then when you actually bring in the loop, it will, it will fix it so that it doesn't violate the condition. And we'll find that like at the classical level, there's two, there's two conditions that you might imagine placing on, on like the asymptotic causality structure uh, of, of the EFT. One of them, they're the same at, at the classical level, uh, one exchange, but at loop level, uh, one of them is, is, is violent, it's no good. So, so maybe to just, uh, yeah, so the two kinds of um, uh, causal conditions you might imagine happening are one which we call asymptotic. So this is just that all particles, all particles uh, have to have a time delay when they go through a perturbed space time compared with what they would have had uh, if the space time was not perturbed. Uh, another one, which we call bulk, is, is basically that maybe there's one species which essentially locally goes faster than all the other particles. So you might think that in the, that the graviton essentially defines a light cone and that all particles should locally uh, move in that light cone. So this is just a picture, but so that would mean that actually all particles should have a time delay. Um, I'll just put I with respect to gravitons, which is zero, meaning that gravitons always move the fastest through the space. And this is a kind of condition which is actually used sometimes where people will compute the speeds around some backgrounds uh, and they'll say that like, you know, all the species of matter has to be moving slower um, than the gravitons locally. And so it turns out that they're the same condition at tree level, but when you include the standard model loops, this one seems to be violated and is, is not actually a good condition, but, but this one is. So this is what like we're we're trying to probe these kind of ideas by having concrete um, examples calculations. It's kind of hard to read the asymptotic one. Like what's above the t? Like the time delay for what? Oh, all. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, just for every species. Yeah. And anything. No relative ordering between the gravitons and everything. Else. Right. Yeah. And so that one uh, works out. So now I need what, a few seconds to uh, figure out what I'm going to do. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at actual uh, results. Um, So, so like uh, like we've kind of mentioned here, these um, if we imagine we have these scalars, there's a limit where where the mass of the particle is very large, uh, where I could integrate it out. You basically expect to get the EFT of that particle. So we find that alpha three, which is the the non-trivial cubic coupling in the EFT here, is just directly related to this F3 uh, function that we have, when the mass of the particle uh, is very large. So we compute this F3 due to the loop, and then in this uh, large mass limit, we get the, back the EFT parameter that, that, that is basically the matching of the EFT. So that's a nice thing, but of course we knew we could do that. And really when it gets interesting is when we go to the to the intermediate uh, energies where we can actually probe the, the loop. Um, 
So of course, if we're going to start probing the loop, then we expect beta functions and uh, things like you know the running of the coupling to uh, show up. And in fact, for uh, charge scalars and fermions, there's an interesting relationship. Which th this is just directly related to the discontinuity in this uh, F1 function. Okay, um, F2 and 3 were loops. And F4 yeah, they only show up at F1 loop. This is the helicity preserving. What's that? So the, aren't the loops always suppressed? Sorry, the... it's a loop at the vertex. So again, the counting is, um, it's, uh, it's like this kind of counting. It's, it is suppressed by factors of the gauge coupling, but it's certainly leading in, as the first order of the gauge coupling. Yeah, the, the, the S squared over T part is, well, this one gives a log square, but um, So it's, uh, it's cool to see that, again, this on-shell data of these F uh, functions is directly related to the beta functions. Um, and so I think maybe from there, I can just basically show kind of the, the results. Um, there's a nice way you can see why this would have to be true. You can ask if you're interested. I think I used a lot less of this than I thought it was. So let's get uh, to the to the end here. So, um, okay, so the way we compute the loops is basically you have some, you know, something like this. And we can do this all on shell by basically doing Kutkowski rules, you know, from, uh, from your QFT uh, days. I feel like we didn't do them a lot in class, but it turns out to be super useful. So you can write this one loop amplitude as like, you know, integral over products of, of tree level amplitudes, which makes calculations super easy. Um, so we do that. We uh, do the transform in um, uh, impact parameter space, and we get these uh, um, phase shifts due to these particles. And I just want to write this so we can stare at it. Yeah, is it the 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 life? Especially for those on certain. This one, I, So these are from the graviton poles at t equals zero. And then we have a contribution from the branch cut. Um, this is not, it's like this continuity of F1 and some Some other functions, but basically it's you know it's all in terms of on-shell data, the graviton pole is t equals zero, and then some discontinuities of these f's. So these are the phase shifts, which we then compute the time delays from. Um, there's two limits that are that we can consider. So in the EFT limit, 
which is basically again m b um, much bigger than one. And we get that this delta plus minus. So um, basically, uh, you can show this part doesn't contribute on the branch cut, and you're left with um, just this contribution at the top. When F1 equals one, notice this is just getting back our log of B over BIR. There's a correction to the coefficient from the loops, but that form uh, stays there. So in the EFT limit, we get the shock wave positive, but then plus or minus is F3, zero, so some non-zero number from the loop, times one over B squared. Now, the whole point of essentially what I was trying to say is that if you wrote this and you start and you calculate, I mean, this is basically just proportional to the time delay. So we know that this first one is positive, it's the log. Now, if I take B to be small, it looks like this second term would take over, could, could take over the first term. This is log B compared with one over B squared. So where is the energy dependence in the second term? Um, oh, there's an S, yeah, sorry. Yeah. They're both proportional to S, yeah, S over M plus. So it looks like, right, like if you just did the EFT, you use that action, it would look like you would violate um, this uh, delta T bigger than zero if B goes small enough. But the point is that, that, that that's, that's right at the limit of where the EFT uh, will break down. So, it, or conversely, you could use it to, to place a cutoff for what, how low this B really can be. And F3 is, you know, G squared over M squared. So you will just see that this B, um, where you should conclude that the cutoff of this EFT theory should be such that you can't violate the, the causality condition. That's how we use them. But we actually get to look at the real expression now because we have the loop. Right, so then we get to see what happens to this term, what it turns into, so that it actually, you know, um, satisfies the, um, the time goal. Okay. So assuming there's nothing else that can run on that loop, I mean, gravitons will be Planck suppressed, but yeah. So yeah, we consider a bunch of stuff. So these are, yeah, three spin zero, one half, one charge states. Right. We talk about, so neutral states really enter at, at, at two loops because they don't couple directly to the photon. Yeah, but you can have quarks. But when you have, um, yeah, exactly. You have the quarks, um, yeah, which, but I guess. Um, I guess you want to say maybe there's a hierarchy of scales between them. There's a G and a different cutoff for each Yeah, different. Um, you have to write down the most general thing. And, but maybe the quarks are taken in. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. Or like neutrinos. Yeah, I don't, um, yeah, the, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, let me think about that. Uh, but let me just get to the, to kind of the punchline. Uh, okay, so that's what you see from the EFT side. But now since we get to open up the loop, um, we have, uh, so, but this is in the limit uh, MB small. Um, you basically get, let's write this log term explicitly. Like I said, these beta functions are actually what enter I didn't really see. I told you about beta functions, but I didn't tell you why they. So, so for the scalars and the uh, fermions, this is what you get. So the beta function directly enters the next order of contribution, which is the log square one here. Now for these, for beta phi and uh, the, um, Scalars, uh, these beta functions are positive. 
Um, so um, remember, this is a positive contribution. So at, since it's log squared compared with log, if you take B small enough, this second term will actually uh, could dominate over the first one because it's log squared compared with log. But if you work it out, it basically that's at the Landau pole of the of the particles in the loop. So for B bigger than uh, the Landau, the scale of the Landau pole, um, this satisfies the, the causality conditions. So obviously, I mean, going past the Landau pole of the gauge theory anyway, you shouldn't do. <laughs> um, so for the Bs that are you know, less than our IR cutoff and bigger than the Landau pole, you do satisfy the, the delta T bigger than zero constraint. And as I think like just a last, so those are the asymptotic calculations where I just compute the overall delta T. Yeah. So, so do you not get any new constraints then? Oh, um, well, we don't get any, we don't get any new constraints on the couplings of the particles. But what, sorry, what this is just saying is that this looks like a correct thing that you should demand of low energy EFTs, right? Because we saw that in the EFT, it looks like you're going to violate the one over B squared, but it actually gets fixed by the UV of these particles, no matter what the particles were, right? We did three different kinds of particles. They all fixed the problem when you look into the loop and they all fix the problem down to the Landau pole. And if there's no Landau pole, it's asymptotically free, then it's fine all the way up to the Planck scale. In fact, it's not a log squared, it's something else. So what we're trying to do is say that this looks like a really good thing that you should demand of low energy EFTs. The one that you should not demand is sending a delta T minus delta T uh, graviton, which basically is just this log piece. Uh, it's the le leading one for the graviton. If you demand that this is bigger than zero, then you essentially, I mean, you could see here already, this is just always negative. Um, and also when you do the vectors uh, in, inside the loop, you find that this can also have either sign. So it's like, you're not allowed to subtract out this first piece basically. And so it, it's not making any sense to locally compare with gravitons um, because the one loop piece is allowed to have either sign. But the, the overall um, time delay does make sense because it, like it satisfies the constraints all the way up to like you know strong coupling scale of, of the particles in the loops. A um, couple of minutes over, I think. Uh, let's make sure I'm not totally. I think uh, I'll I'll end it there and then you can answer more questions. So thank you. Any quick questions for the speaker? Yeah. So I'm just trying to get a perspective from more, uh, say, point shell method. Yeah. There, if you specify holistic of external particles, right, it more or less fixes the amplitude because of the little group scaling, mm -hmm. except discrete uh, possibilities. In some cases, you get a momentum sitting downstairs. You usually rule up because it's normal for theory. Yeah, yeah, you, you need to one with the, So I guess your approach then it seems to be that you, you keep that uh, sensible piece from on shell, and yet you multiply by some function of STU, which is dimensionless, and then that yeah. momentum dependence seems to be captured by this F one two three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could write down all the spinner. I mean, we write the formulas in terms of the spinners and like. There's the normal one, which is like just the same spinner structure that, uh, like, I was going to show this, but shows how naive I was about timing. Like, yeah, you can do exactly this calculation, uh, super nice with, uh, like, literally, yeah. There's nothing. There's no input. It's all just fixed by little group and stuff. And so um, that's one structure. That's like the F one. Then the F2 and F3 are other um, spinner structures that, that are allowed to, to be there. 
Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're not allowing higher than linear order graviton interactions in your effective field theory. Right? So so any yeah. violation of causality then would be coming from higher derivative terms in the standard model, effective field theory of the standard model. Um right. So you're set, so yeah, in this case, um yeah, we're not probing. Yeah, we're just probing minimal coupling uh, of things to gravity. So yeah, it's either from the standard model sector or the way that that interacts with with the minimal coupling. Yeah, but not not specifically the graviton for three point functions, which d equals four is actually kind of hard to do because of this log. And, Okay. Yeah. What were the assumption? Like, what kind? Of, what kind of theories did these bounds apply to? So, are you ignoring massive spin two stuff or no? Um, we didn't put a spin two. Um, yeah, we're ignoring massive spin two. Okay. And yeah. you're for this particular one, I guess you what also assume yeah. that there is no lower spin stuff that contributes. There is just a spin one that goes in the loop. No, we can we consider charge scalars, spin one, you did. and um, fermions in the loop. Massive, yeah. Sorry, I guess I missed up them. No, I didn't really say it because I didn't have time. But almost all this oh, uh, applies to each one of the. I mean, oh no, I, I, I did write it somewhere, but I might not have even said it out loud. Yeah, yeah. Each one has slightly different. I mean, they all have different coefficients and the massive vectors have a slightly different behavior because of these IR divergences you have to resum, but we did all, all three. And so the, the output was not, as you said, uh, like you're not putting bounds on the coefficients of the couplings. You're saying, well, if there's things thing exists in the theory, like I'll tell you what the column scale has to be. Is that yeah, or, or I'll tell, tell you what I think is a, is a good, I'll tell you what I think is a bad condition to try to place on your EFT, which is the local or bulk causality condition, because that is clearly just violated by standard model. So you should never, I mean, not never, we don't, I mean, there could be subtleties, but in what we did, it doesn't like, the obvious thing is violated. So um, in a sense, instead of testing a theory and putting a constraint on the theory, he tells us which criteria is the correct one to test causality of given. By exactly. Using UV complete codal theory and computing things. Understood. And uh, this, I guess I don't know if this is true in this context, but is there also an assumption of no existence of towers? Oh, like higher spins? Well, or higher yeah. massives? Yeah, higher massives. Yeah, I mean, I guess this would be um, like the interesting thing here would be. Um, yeah, is it the uh, smallest towers can be smallest mass and scaling is so. yeah, yeah, we're not doing the resum. Yeah, and that's another yeah. way to solve the problem is to have tree level exchange of massive spin two in higher states. Like, okay. Here you're solving uh, yeah, the problem. Yeah, yeah that's the same Maldacena problem. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly what Maldacena does to look at okay, is there a way to UV to fix uh, these causality problems by having this state be different? And then he says, well, yeah, you have to add, keep adding higher and higher states so that it you know, basically regiaizes or something in, in this limit. But that, yeah, exactly. That's, that's not what we're, what we're looking at. It's more, I guess, the in the standard model sector couple, um, coupling of gravity. But yeah, actually related to that, have, have you thought about trying to do this for pure gravity in the sense that, so what's going on here is there's one way to phrase it is like there's a problem in the EFT. And yeah. the way you solve that problem is new states enter at the mass scale m, and then like yeah. the loops resolve the resolve the problem. And I know in pure gravity you can identify a similar problem if you have like R cube couplings, which you can then fix by introducing new states at tree level. But you might ask if you could also fix the problem with just loops of gravitons, whether that can fix the problem without having new states. Oh yeah, that'd be an interesting interesting thing to try. And since you phrased everything on shell, all you need are like yeah. Three level four point graviton amplitudes, which are totally known. So it, yeah. it should be doable. 
Yeah, and then I could double copy them. Uh, no, um, yeah, I mean, we yeah, it's interesting. We'd have to check the scaling, but maybe the scale, exactly, if there's something interesting happening, maybe uh, the ordering of the diagrams becomes kind of different. And um, no, that, that's, it seems like if you, if you're violating causality here, then like adding in an interaction well, in pure gravity, the problem will happen at impact parameters of order and plane. Right, like and exactly. so indeed loops can become important. Like you might cancel off like these scalings because you really are at this order exactly. one. Exactly, exactly. And um, could fix uh, like it's almost exactly or similar to what happened here. Like the scaling from the EFT, yeah, looks like not going to work out. But when you actually have the loop, you saturate somewhere to the loop. It has a different behavior. Yeah, I um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, we thought about, because again, like this, we didn't do anything with gravity here. So it's definitely an open door in some sense, like, because, but again, the scaling doesn't look like it's gonna, like those loops are gonna help, but we didn't go in detail to that. So it's possible. How, how would the loop, so are you thinking about gravity plus a bear off you? Yeah, yeah. So things plus like R things R like R Einstein Hilbert plus R cubed plus R cubed uh, suppressed so by M Planck. Good. So now you have a problem and you say uh, loop, loops of gravitons, you would hope could somehow cure it. I mean I kind of suspect Einstein not, Hilbert. but I would like to know, you know. Yeah, yeah know. like like if you're gonna do this all gravitons, who knows? Yeah, I don't know. What happens to your loop? Before we get to that, there are whole classes of diagrams that have been ignored in yeah, becoming the ladders so what sorry are, are you are, is there some statement that that those can't affect uh, the result wait yeah so which ones are you talking about um oh i mean just i mean there's a whole slew of uh you know multi-graviton vertices uh yeah, yeah, from the expansion right. of the einstein action yeah that's true like these seagull diagrams, stuff like that. Like the uh, ladders are no longer believed. Yeah, like them. these ones. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So are you asking in the context of this last comment about curing graviton causality or just in general? Um, take your pick. <laughs> yeah, in the graviton causality, I agree. I mean, there's I don't have a super strong intuition for what could happen there. I think that would be an interesting calculation just in its own right. Um, I have no expectation for what, whether or not it will uh, cure the, the um, cause that causality problems in, with gravity. Is it still in leading or in the apical approximation or not? Well, um, yeah, the, the thing is that you, you extract these observables that by going to the iconal limit. Right. So I'm like asking whether those, those type of diagrams. Oh, is this, does, does this survive like, in the in GR? Like, yeah, this one does not contribute to the phase shift. Okay. Uh, then in there won't yeah. to the then entangle either. But but your impact parameter, in case you want to talk about pure gravity, it has to go down to a order where these things will all start to contribute. That means that sort of you cannot use the uh, icon or. Yeah, yeah, there's going to be a lot of. Then that means it's completely different, right? You, then you, you don't even have a way to do something. Well, yeah, it's, it, I mean, another thing that, like, um, an old, uh, I think, Rotazzi paper is like, you can also think of this scattering as super high energy trans Planckian scattering, where almost no matter what, gravity dominates, right? And then, then again, it's just that. So you could be at super high energies above n Planck, uh, and then again, th this is the diagram that contributes um, in the iconal limit. So there is a sense in which you can access. It's like the shock wave again. It's like the super high energy is also somehow very simple um, if gravity dominates. But yeah, I mean, I would have to think of how that would work out, but. Yeah. It's not even possible. Yeah. All those higher, like RQ, those, those terms, presumably also always, always contribute that type of diagrams. Like with a lot of legs coming out of the one point 
and then not like single T channel thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think there is a controlled calculation like yeah. I was wanting to do. Okay. I agree. Great. So, um, if there are any more discussions to be had, maybe we can do this offline. Sure. So let's uh, let's thank Matt again. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is basically what Anna Sena does, right? So, it's all, all the Sena basically. Yeah. It's kind of